am excited for everyone listening. I'm going to introduce you. Well, actually, I'll have Rebecca introduce herself. She's known as the 20 Word Pro. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Okamoto. I'm a communication and personal branding consultant. I help people introduce, market, and promote themselves in 20 words or less. Awesome. Very concise. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. So we, we were connected to uh, William, who we knew each other back at Trinet. I know that he was on the, the West Coast, so he was making waves on the West Coast when I was doing that on the East Coast. So that's how we connected. But I'm so glad that he connected us. You're, I, I talk about you actually all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really amazing because he and I made a connection on a on some sort of like networking event that was virtual. Then we talked and then right after that, he flagged you on something on LinkedIn and said, you got to meet this guy. <laughs> so he did a great job connecting us. Yeah, that, that's the cool thing about LinkedIn. It's, I've connected with a lot of random people. That's how I got to LinkedIn. I would just reach out to all the Asians at LinkedIn and <laughs> ask them to help me out. And that's how I got here, actually. Yeah, what a great way of doing it. Yeah, I think LinkedIn has gone from it's just a digital resume holding place to like the premier way to market, promote, meet people. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I saw that you have one post that like literally went viral, like was the definition of viral. What, what was that like? Like just seeing all the feedback and man, that must have been awesome. I was really shocked. So that one was um, five ways to introduce yourself perfectly in 20 words or less. And uh, if people are still looking at it in comments. And I was really shocked because I posted it kind of like randomly. And then I kept getting all these notifications from LinkedIn, had to turn the notifications off. <laughs> but it made a huge difference. And I went from, I kid you not, like an email list of two, my dad, <laughs> who would print my blog uh -huh. and mail it, snail mail it to his friends to say, read my daughter's blog. And like my nephew who was like helping me with my blog and it, my email list up to like 9,000 people within a couple of months. That, I mean, that's the, that's the power of having a concise message, right? Because I was reading it and I was like, oh, like you can easily digest this so simply. And I, I think the takeaway is to have something where people can read it in a matter, because like you said, people's attention span now is, is, is horrible. I mean, you look at things like TikTok and, and Instagram, and it's like, if you have, it's it less than five seconds, people will scroll to the next one, you know? Right. In fact, um, one study out of like, I think it was like the University of Scotland said that just by the way you say the word hello, people are judging you on your credibility and trustworthiness. And men and women have to say it differently. Just the word hello. So women have to sound more authoritative. They have to say like, hello. See like the intonation goes down. But yeah. men have to sound more friendly. They have to say like, hello. And their intonation has to kind of go up. So it's on NPR. Um, you had me at hello. It's a fascinating read. And then they have a, an audio clip you can listen to. And you can hear the difference of trustworthiness. And that's just with one word. Wow. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with, um, I'm obsessed with how somehow Steve Jobs managed to get us to buy iPods by saying thousand tunes in your pocket and creating something so am amazing with just the few number of words. So I'm obsessed with clarity and conciseness. Yeah. I think especially now in the world of social media, I think it's made it, I think every year, every generation gets less and more and more distracted right as technology takes over our lives and you get pinged every five seconds so yeah i just tell people you have a better chance of engaging with a goldfish <laughs> so if you think about trying to say something to a goldfish they'll have a nine second attention span that's how long you have to get you have eight seconds for an adult or less to capture their attention so i'm like uh, how do you get how do you walk in and own the room immediately so that someone says, tell me more or let's schedule more time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting. I think we're not really taught these things, like even going to school and college, like Correct. these yeah. things are talked about, but it's so much more valuable. Right. I mean, well, they teach people teach us 
they give us formats like Procter and Gamble was the art of the one page memo, but, and they told you like follow the template, but they didn't really tell you why it mattered or how to, how to use it. So you would get really new people and they would use like size five font and then no margins. And they're like, well, I got it to one page. I'm like, yeah, that's not what I meant. You, you know? Um, and so we're taught to be format followers but we're really not taught how to anticipate what someone wants and how to nail that. And what I've learned now is you can actually teach it. So I spent all my corporate career puzzling about how do I know what they want to actually figuring out, oh, that's how you figure out what they want. So that's how you capture attention in like 20 words. Yeah, one of the, the most successful guys at LinkedIn, uh, Adrian, that's it. I asked him like, what's the one thing you learned from working with the top 20 accounts, like of LinkedIn's biggest 20 accounts. He said, speak in headlines. He Correct. said, he said, if you have a proposal, that's like 15 pages, trim it down to three pages. Like no one's going to read the whole thing. He's like, the better you, you can get at trimming things down, the more successful you'll be, the higher you go up. Yes, that's exactly right. I, I mean, when I work with job hunters um, and they'll call me and say, I introduced myself like at a networking event with like 20, 30 people and I got pulled aside and offered an interview or a job after a 20 word introduction with 30 other people or 20 other people because their introduction stood out in its 20 words. And I don't know, I, I'm an engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. And I used to think that, you know, like 20, if 20 words is great, 20 bullet points is better. 20 minutes is better. 20 slides is better. Hmm. Um, and I've learned that 20 words or less is perfect. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool because it's, it's proven, right? And I right. Think, think nowadays there's just so much that are, I mean, every executive, like you're getting emails, you're getting emails every five seconds, right? So, you know, they, they just want, okay, like what's the essence of what you're trying to say? Right. And I will say I'm really focused now on strategic communication. So helping really top talent, high potential managers break through to the executive level. And um, what they don't realize is, I mean, the people at the executive level got there because they're super smart. So they only need 20 words to decide, do I need to learn more or is that all that I need to hear? Right. Um, and they're making decisions they're making snap decisions with a five minute pitch, you know, they're going with their gut because they're super smart. So they only need headlines and when they want more, they'll ask you for it. Right. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And, and um, just so the listeners know, so you were also the youngest, was it Asian executive or youngest? Asian I was the first Asian American woman to hit what PNG, the PNG is like top 1%. So they had a different band structure level. So the titling is not standard, but it was essentially the top 1%. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't necessarily, well, since I was the first, I was at that point, I'll say the youngest, but yeah, I was um, very ambitious at one point in my career. And I decided I want to be the first I want to be the first Asian woman at this level, but another woman who was in um, Asia got there before me, a friend of mine actually. And then I said, well, I want to be the first Asian American woman. And I was unfortunately though, for 12 years, the only one at that level. After I left PNG, they didn't re promote another person for two more years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I think in so many ways, like we've come a long way Right. But this year is, is like a perfect example of how we have so much more to go. Right. In terms of equality, um, unconscious bias. I mean, a lot of we don't even recognize we're, we're doing it. Agreed. The one that fascinates me is the part where um, they'll they've shown studies where they'll have a white woman lecturer, like a picture of her to, to students. And then they'll swap in a picture of a Asian woman and then the same white woman lecturing and people hear an accent when they see the Asian professor's face. Hmm. And that's unconscious bias. And so as soon as they think, well, she's got an accent, she doesn't know English or whatever comes to their mind, and it's completely unconscious. And I, I mean, I got that my entire life and I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. 
Yeah. My Japanese is terrible. My Japanese has an accent. My my American English is fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the worst. And even in 2021, people are like, "Wow, your English is really good." It's like, yeah. like I'm really like it in this age. In this age, yeah, yeah. I was in Japan, and then some guy from New York City came, and he's like, "Why is your English so good?" I'm like, "Dude, I'm American." <laughs> <laughs> like why are you so ignorant <laughs> please you're this is embarrassing yeah i mean i mean yeah i mean but your last name is is like very clearly you know japanese japanese yeah probably why people just assume well obviously and then you know my grandparents immigrated all all of my grandparents so i mean i'm 100 es- ethnically i'm 100 percent japanese so i look asian look japanese but i was raised yeah in the middle middle west Ooh, and that and that must be tough in the Midwest too, right? Because from what I hear, there's even less diversity over, right? Or is Detroit pretty diverse? Well, when I grew up, it was black and white, and there was a lot of black white racial tension, and there were very few Asians. And when I uh, we moved across the state to a smaller town, and there were like no other Asians except for a couple um, refugees from Vietnam, like two other. So I spent my entire call it youth without knowing any other Asians other than my family members. Mm. Yeah. And, and even, I feel like in Japanese even has a smaller percentage, right? Like I, I meet, I mean, I, I'm Vietnamese, so I meet tons of Vietnamese people, but I had, I don't think I've, I've met, I don't, I think I only know one or two other Japanese people. It's, it's extremely rare. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, it's like in Japantown or little Tokyo in LA, you know, that's, I see lots of Japanese. I'll see them in San Jose you know, out here, but yeah, it's not, um, yeah, uh, seeing an Asian face was great, let alone a Japanese face, you know? Yeah. So I found it, uh, I found it really interesting because I wasn't used to the bias or the discrimination because I was the only one and I couldn't tell, I couldn't <laughs> tell why. <laughs> uh, you weren't, you weren't sure like what it was exactly. You just knew that you, you... there was something. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I'll tell you though, I lived in, when I moved to Japan and I lived there four or five years. And uh, what I noticed was, so in Japan, because I'm clearly Japanese, I got great service. And then my white friends didn't. And then um, apparently my face is very moldable. So if I went to Korea, people thought I was Korean. If I went to uh, Singapore, Indonesia, people thought I was like Indo- Chinese. They, so I blended really well. And I started to realize what it, the privilege of what it looks like to blend. And I could see that I was getting less discrimination, even though technically I did not speak the language or understand the culture. I was better accepted just by the way I looked. And then I would go back to the US and I could feel the racism because I could see I wasn't getting the same level of great treatment because of the way I looked. And I'm like, I didn't know how much racism there was. I'm you know, unconscious until I was part of a majority and was completely accepted by the way I looked. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. So it sounds like you were a chameleon at one point, right? Just because you had to be like when you were much younger and that skill like allowed you to or w- did you say like would you say you were a chameleon to a certain extent like just in the beginning of your career and my being my career was not um i was very asian american i was super timid worse <laughs> worse than just humble but like really timid and i didn't know how to speak up and i would have been a classic i thought i was going to grow up to be a classic wear a white lab coat and carry a clipboard engineer and never speak up and never run a team. But it turned out I was a really terrible engineer. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I practically got fired, but I got sent to a manufacturing location to build up my technical skills. And then around people, I learned to thrive. And I started to realize I was actually a much more people person than I thought I was. But I grew up thinking I was gonna be a single contributor Hmm. and that no one would ever work for me and that I would never confront a soul. (laughs) Um, So, I think I told you early in my career, I was really unremarkable and I was, and I was kind of hoping one day to be just sort of like an average manager who blended in. That was my aspiration. So going from almost being fired to being, to blend in was my uh, big achievement early in my career. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like be in a way 
the the fact that you weren't a great engineer like made like actually worked out in your favor right because it, it helped you be able to flex other muscles that you're like wow i'm actually pretty good at this i would agree and so the one thing i love about our culture well like there was no way i was going to quit though like they're going to have to fire me but i'm going to have to find a way to make this work and i'm not going to just sit here and keep getting criticized or not fitting in that's why i asked i actually asked for a transfer but i was just like i'm not going to tell my mother that i quit i'm going to find a way out of this and i told myself driving nine hours from cincinnati to this place in uh, northeast pennsylvania i'm like I'm just going to be someone else and I'm just going to pretend to have some sort of confidence. Hmm. Um, and I'm going to speak up even though I'm going to feel embarrassed because I cannot continue to be criticized for being so like uh, not effective. And I wanted to be effective. I wanted to fit in and I didn't know how to do it. So that part about like bearing down or serve, you know, being resourceful, I think is something that we do really well. Mm. yeah you kind of you kind of have to be right yeah like right. like because we've inter, you know immigrating to another country you, you kind of have to be and uh, I'm, I'm curious like why do you think asian parents don't emphasize a lot more of these managerial skills as much as you know maybe science and math and you know engineering and some of those skills tend to be more focused on? Do you think it's because of the stability of these, these positions? I, I would guess so. My parents um, were very Asian, but in different ways. So my mom, um, she passed away when she was 95 and she, she was a physician. So like way, way back in the day, there were no women physicians, but in Japan, she became a physician. So she was born in the US, she immigrated or went back to Japan went to high school, college and medical school, and she was a practicing physician. So she always believed in education for women and that was important and that you should always get the highest level of education you should. So, but when they, when she moved to the US, my dad's a minister, so they knew nothing about technical careers, but they had met this Polish couple whose sons were engineers who had become quote unquote something. One son became a doctor, one son became a businessman, and one son became a lawyer. So whatever this engineer thing was, must be good because you become something, something recognizable like a doctor or whatever. Um, but I think they really uh, always encouraged us, everyone in my family to like learn as much as possible and you have a lot of talent, so you're supposed to fulfill your talent. So do, you, so do you think Asians have a leg up in the sense that it seems like we have a lot of work ethic, right? But, but I think to your point, like work ethic is only such a small portion piece of the puzzle that it, it, it's like almost like our kryptonite, it's, it's like our kryptonite in some ways. Yeah, so exactly. Because my parents told me, hey, when you go to work, you have to be really humble. Never talk about yourself. Never uh, raise your hand. Wait to be asked. Let your work speak for yourself because you have to be a super hard worker. And out of my peer group, I was the last person to get promoted. Wow. Uh, and, there, and, and I was positive I wouldn't be last. I was positive people could see how hard I worked. Mm. And eventually I found out that they knew I was a hard worker. They knew I was helping other people get great results, which made them think, yeah, you're a great, solid worker, but you're not a leader. Hmm. So how, how do they know how well you're going to make a decision um, or push back if they never hear you speak. Right. So they knew I was super helpful, but they didn't know if they put her in charge of like 30, 40, 60 people, would she be able to push back if they push back on her? Would she be able to answer a question with authority? Because they had never heard me speak up, but they knew I was smart because obviously I was helping all these other people get great results. So hmm. I was recognized for being smart, but without leadership. Right. So they just, they just assume, so in the beginning, so what made, what was your like aha moment that, I mean, I'm sure there are multiple moments, but what was like the defining moment where you're like, all right, like something's got to change? Um, well, I'll tell you, it's not something about something's got to change, but the moment I realized it was not just like an average manager. So I was telling you before I, I had a mentor, so I got, I finally get promoted into, I was, I worked in a plan about 650 people and they made me the safety manager. <laughs> like, it's like the bottom feeder job in a plant. 
It's where you tell people you're walking too fast, you know, hold the handrail. You are widely despised. Hmm. Like, so I get promoted, last out of my peer group, in the worst job in the plant. And I went to the plant manager. I'm like, I do not want this job. This is the worst job in the plant. And the person before me was seriously the most despised person in the plant. And he's like, it's too bad. And I'm like, I do not want this job. And he's like, it's too bad. So he said, well, let's set, let's set your goals. At that point, like um, the injury rate was 2.56 people per hundred were getting seriously injured, have to go to the doctor, get a stitch put in, you know, um, breaking bones, things like that. So he said, how much do you want to reduce that rate? And I said, let's reduce it by over 30% to 1.5. So 2.4, like to 1.5. He's like, perfect. So your goal is 1.0. I'm like, no, no, no. I said 1.5. It's like more than a 30% reduction. It's a big deal. So he said, yeah, 1.0. And I'm like, really mad now because I don't want the job. And he's setting a goal that is over 50%. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I said, that you're just setting me up for failure. So he said, well, I'll mentor you. I'm like, I don't want your mentorship. I don't even want the job. So I went back to my desk and I thought about, here's what people are doing today and here's where I want them to go. And here are 10 things I'm going to implement. I put the plan in my drawer. One year later, we hit a 1.0. Wow. And I went back to my book. I went back to him. I mean, we've been meeting, but I just said, hey, let's look at the results. My God, I hit a 1.0. And he said, you know, I actually didn't think you would ever hit a 1.0. <laughs> I was like, what? And he said, well, I didn't, I didn't know if you would get to 1.5 unless I gave you a stretch goal. Mm. I would have been perfectly happy with 1.5, but I believe in stretch. But, I, but the moment I realized that at that point, I did not know that leadership was something that could be taught or done. And I didn't know that one person could move the needle for 650 people. Like No one worked for me. So I did it all through influence. And it was my first promoted job as a manager and then I thought to myself, I think I'm really remarkable. Mm. Like how many people could really move the needle that fast? And my plant manager was a high flyer. So he's like, I've actually never seen anybody change results so fast. And he said, I wanted you to in this job because I thought you were remarkable. And I, I had thought, I'm like, oh no, I'm no one special. And then I thought, maybe I am someone special. And that was the first time I thought, I was more than just average. What I heard in that is that because you had clear goals, it also helped, right? Because I think a lot of us are like, oh, I want to get promoted one day. There's, there's less, like, it's not specific enough. Yeah, super clear goals. And then um, I did not know what mentorship meant. I mean, so I did not think highly of myself. Someone thought highly of me. I didn't know that that could help. But mentorship really changed how I grew my career. That's why I'm really big on mentorship. And when I meet people like you and I think, oh my God, I see something there. You want to pay it back and you want to grow it because I didn't think I had it in me. And someone believed in me more than I believed in myself. I had a brilliant career because of him. I'm positive of that because I would have never gotten started had I not gotten that result. So, so when was it that moment when you hit the 1% where you, when you realized like, oh, wow, I'm capable of more? Or was it even before that when you were, you know, just under his mentorship? No, it, I can clearly still remember sitting at my desk, opening my drawer and looking at that plan and realizing I hit everything. And I thought, my God, this is really incredible. Like, I, I think this is really remarkable. I was absolutely positively shocked. Um, and that's when I realized, wow, a person, a single human being can really change people's lives. It's like, I, I mean, I had an aha about leadership because I thought leaders were, I don't know, born or destined. Hmm. I didn't know it could be taught. And I didn't know that me, as someone I thought was completely average, could make a difference. Like, and it, we were the second largest employer in that plant, I mean, in the town. Of like 200,000 people. And um, so you're talking about teams and families, like it, it impacts a lot of people when people are healthy and mm. things like that. And it made a huge, huge difference. And I was just floored that 
just remember thinking, I actually helped all those people. Hmm. I, I just did, I was just amazed that a person could help people in that regard. That's and and then do you think the one of the reasons why you initially didn't see it was because like there's less examples of Asian women in these types of roles? Like I think sometimes it's easier to have that vision when you see others like you and then you can at least like ask them questions. Right? Oh, I would I would agree that mentorship or role models are really important. You you can't be what you can't imagine yourself to be. Yeah. Uh, I there were I had no Asian women. I only had one Asian woman boss my entire career and I happened to be an Asian woman she was my boss. So you have to find a mentor somewhere and a role model and you have but you can't be what you can't see. Right. So it was really yeah, I had to find other role models to help me envision uh, but it made it, I didn't really understand it until I had a mentor mm -hmm. and how important it was. And so I always try to be a mentor and always try to have a mentor. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on seeking mentors outside of the company? Like, do you think that it's, because I think what a lot of, what I hear from a lot of younger people is, is I'm afraid, like, how can I give back to my mentor? You know, I think sometimes people feel like they're, they're not reciprocating or they feel like, oh, like I feel like I'm just taking. Well, if someone wants to be a mentor and they're a good mentor, they're active, they get a lot from the relationship. They wouldn't, you, you can't, if you judge yourself as nobody and unless you can give back to them, then you're a terrible, I don't know, what's the word, mentee? Yeah. We enter these relationships because we get a lot from it because we watching someone grow in and of itself is a reward. Watching other people give back to other people expands influence. So I'm really passionate about helping Asian American leaders grow faster because they're going to help Asians everywhere. Yeah. So helping someone, if I want to help 50 people, it's one thing, but if 50 people help thousands more, that's more important. So I think um, to anyone who thinks I can't give back to my mentor, you shouldn't assume you know what that, what drives the mentor. Hmm. You shouldn't assume that you're not giving back to them. You're right. diminishing yourself. Hmm. Um, it's, re it's very rewarding to watch someone like yourself do incredible things and thinking, wow, I wish I had that when I was younger and hoping that you do better than I do. It's very, very rewarding to do that. That that's that's a great summary. That's a great reminder because because I do think I mean this is like the number one question I get asked all the time because I do have a lot of younger this is their just right out of college that I'll talk to and they're like oh like what can I do to help you it's like dude you're helping me already you know but it's it's, just, it's hard for people to understand that sometimes you know yeah and just like what you don't know is like you made an introduction for me now right and it could turn into something incredible. It, it, and you think, oh, it's nothing. I introduce people all the time. Right. But you introduce me to someone that I never would have had access to before. That's something. And you don't even realize it. You don't realize many times, you don't, as the mentee, you don't realize how special you are. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the other two people for the objection workshop that yeah. we're thinking about doing, both of them, too, are probably more talented than, than I am. And, and they're, they're way more ambitious. Like, I think both of them, Ivana and Brandon, have, like, so much potential. Yeah, awesome. Is, is one of my mentors. Um, he, he's, he's, he's awesome. So I was like, yeah, like, you, you would all definitely get along together. You know, so that's, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to talk about, like, what, how'd you come up with the name like evoke, like what made you choose that word? And what are your thoughts on like Asians being entrepreneurial? Because I do think that's not as common or I think it's changed. I think in Silicon Valley and I think in California, there's a lot more entrepreneur, Asian entrepreneurs. But other than tech, I feel like I don't really see as many. Yeah, so evoke means to unlock hidden untapped or unfulfilled potential so like there's invoking provoking evoking and i feel that someone evoked in me so someone untapped or unlocked my potential 
So hidden, untapped, or unrealized potential is what evoke means. So I'm like, that's who I am. I want to evoke people's potential um, and exceed, not just succeed, but exceed what they actually think is possible. Because that's honestly what mentoring did for me was I exceeded everything I thought I could do because one person believed in me more than I believed in myself. So that's why I picked the word evoke. Mm -hmm. um, as an entrepreneur, I know we're we like, because we're so cautious, we want everything buttoned up. It, I think it's really important to, um, like you're like the five people you're around with the most. So you have to be around other entrepreneurs. I did not see myself as an entrepreneur until I saw my other friends being entrepreneurs. Ah. None of, only one was Asian, the rest were white. And then I started to see, oh, if they can do it, I can see myself doing it. So this role modeling is really important. Yeah. And um, asking them, and then I make, I usually, you can see I write a lot about mistakes that I make because it, then people can see it's okay to make a mistake. Being an entrepreneur doesn't mean there are, no, there are no risks or that you know everything. Being an entrepreneur means you're, you, can tr you know how to try or fall, fail forward. Hmm. Um, but I try to help people reduce some of the downside. I think getting coaching when you're an entrepreneur actually is really important to reduce some of the downside. You're not wandering so aimlessly. Is, I think there's something about Asians and like the face, like saving face that has to do with why we tend to like not to show public failure. I think yeah, probably. And, and yeah. I think especially in Korean and Japanese culture as well, right? It, it seems oh, yeah. a very like it's the, the public persona is so important. So if you do have a mess up, like it does seem like it, it it's, whereas I think in America, the, the stig it's like it's almost cool to fail now right but only in america like i feel like not everywhere is like that well right america loves an underdog america love americans love rags to riches and overcoming failure yeah i i totally agree um that that's really important but i a lot of this being an entrepreneur is like well if you come from a corporate job you think you need to have everything perfect so i have a friend who was just like you're ready to go it's completely imperfect the time to launch is now and call it proof of concept expect to fail and learn instead of trying to be 100 percent buttoned up so when you work at png that you launch something it cannot fail you're it's a publicly traded company you're, you put millions of dollars into it he's like you're a solopreneur <laughs> like hmm. you're the only way to learn is to launch a proof of concept launch it really rough and then adjust along the way. That's probably the biggest thing that I learned was it was okay to fail. And in fact, you should, you want to find the pitfalls to keep perfecting it. Yeah. Because the stakes are so much higher, obviously when it's like a multi-billion dollar company, right? Exactly. Yeah. The failures could mean like millions and millions of dollars. So. Right. And I've saw, I've seen colossal things just fail. And so then you want to work even harder to make sure nothing fails. Whereas entrepreneurs are going to fail. You just want to, like I said, fail forward, or you want to have your biggest failures early when less is on the line. You haven't invested as much. So you're making these changes. So the time you really launch it and put your money into it, you know, you have a much more than a reasonable chance of winning. Mm. That's good advice. Yeah. I think many of us don't think like it, in, in the beginning, you're almost allowed to make more mistakes because the stakes aren't as high, right? But once, you know, once one day, if you have a hundred people that, you know, are working under you, then, then obviously like, that's probably when you probably should be making less mistakes, you know? Yeah. So like a friend of mine, she's been taking this class on developing a lead magnet. I don't know how long she's been working on it. A long time. I've launched three courses since then. <laughs> Yeah. Three courses, right? Which means three um, sales pages, like the courses, the selling of it, the, the taping of the course, the putting it on the website, three courses, and she hasn't done a single free lead magnet. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, and I've had lead magnets with all the courses, right? And I was just like, you have to just put it out there. And if no one bites, you know, you did it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, it's interesting because in a way, like the perfectionism gets you to a certain point, but then when you're an entrepreneur, you have to really let that go or else like you're never going to be able to finally launch, you know? 
Yeah, and it's like, yeah, it totally. And I mean, I remember how you, when I started a blog, uh, I blog a lot and I put tons of stuff out there and I was not a good blogger, but you could see what people were clicking on and you could see which, what they gravitated towards or not gravitate towards. And I wouldn't have known that had I, I'd still be perfecting that first post <laughs> from 2014 if I had, you know, stick with my normal process. But I'm really glad I went out there and pushed send because you, I found out, I, I want to be this really inspirational blogger it turns out I'm very instructional. Hmm. So I wanted to be the I have a dream kind of person. I'm not. I'm the here's how you do it. And people are like, my God, it transformed my sales pipeline. I mean, I get really nice notes from people saying your blog changed everything because I tell you step by step what to do. I'm like, well, maybe I'm instructional. Huh. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good takeaway. Well, I know it's coming up at the top of the hour. I really appreciate you, Rebecca. So many takeaways in just going for it, not and being able to impact others. Like you know, like knowing that we have a ripple effect. Like the more you you mentor others, like the more, and and really thinking like holistically, thinking long term, right? How that, the trajectory of that person's career will eventually impact so many thousands of people. And honestly, I mean, we've only had a few conversations and I, and I feel like I've been changed so much already. Like I see myself asking bolder questions, being a little bit more forward with some of my, my, my requests. Like, so thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I can't wait for the class for us to do and whatever comes next. I'm like really excited about that. And thank you for having me on the podcast. I was really flattered. Yeah. And and I'll, I'll include the link to your website and your LinkedIn and everything. So if anyone wants to reach out and have a conversation, um, please do so. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks.